you know, the one pasta, and they'll hear you right. They're all fitting in together. These Italian playwrights who flew in just for this evening, I want you all to know this. And it was made possible uh, by the uh, Italian Cultural um, Institute. And tonight we have with us uh, Giorgio Hanstrom, uh, uh, a writer and novelist who's the new head uh, of the Italian Cultural Institute. So thank you, thank you for um, um, coming, and also with some Fabio Torsi, who also has come to earlier to our event. So I hope this is a continuation of a friendship, but also the beginning of a new chapter and uh, a coordination and, and, uh, uh, of uh, uh, events we all are, are planning to do. This project is exceptional. We'll be here tonight, and it's all happened uh, because uh, Valeria, uh, who came from, is a producer, a real producer, who produces very significant big stage productions in, in Italy, came, took some time out to work here in New York to see what is possible, what could she do here, and then can one who really bridges between European theater and American theater, and uh, we are uh, tremendously uh, grateful for her coming to us with the idea, and um, her company, Humanism, um, uh, is deeply involved uh, with this. It's a, a cultural organization that is also uh, trying to have a global dialogue, and, and, uh, uh, and we have uh, with us um, also Marco and Tommaso, um, here, who will fly to Rome tonight because he's translating for Edward Bond tomorrow. He is his translator. Um, so we have a, a, a quite an interesting lineup. The playwrights are significant, significant Italian playwrights, masters of their field. They all have won great awards. They were selected by a selection committee um, of over 15 or 16 entries. And we looked at uh, what would really work good here, like a homeopathic pill. What would be a play American playwrights could, uh, could react to? So we have a, 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 a great I think, presentation, and it's a great, great honor that you come, came here in person. There has been a little gap of perhaps 15, 20 years of contemporary playwrights coming to New York, seeing what is going on. And uh, so it is uh, also a significant event in itself, I think, for, uh, for American-Italian uh, theater uh, uh, relations. So it's a, a truly historic um, event, I would say. And, um, and uh, also, we have uh, four directors with us, and we will uh, then they will introduce the plays. So there are yeah, significant uh, voices, new emerging voices in the field. So there's also a real connection to the New York theater scene, in like New York actors who will uh, show four excerpts. So the structure of the evening will be a short um, introduction about the project in Italian theater by uh, Valeria, uh, 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 the producer and the, the um, mastermind, in a way, also behind uh, the, the project. Then we will have um, the readings and then a discussion um, with the writers. And again, uh, in advance, thanks to the directors. Um, maybe they can raise their arms so we see them where they are. One, two, three. Here they are, and so thank you. And uh, they will also introduce the place. And of course, for the actors for giving their time and talent um, to uh, be with us tonight. And after 90 minutes, it shouldn't be much, much longer uh, after the questions. We have a little reception at a bar uh, close by. It is called the Archive Bar. It is on 36 uh, between uh, Fifth Avenue and uh, Madison on the, uh, on, the north, on the south side. So I hope you might be able to come and uh, join us. If you have a cell phone, um, since we're now coming to the serious part, please do take it out and uh, make sure it is off, and I hope you all do the same. Okay, ringer off, I should say. And again, thank you all uh, for coming on such a wonderful day. I know uh, how busy everybody is in the holiday season. We need good theater, but we also need a good, good audience. And we have uh, fantastic people also here, be with us, Bonnie Maranka and David Villinger, and, and um, so many, Beata Hein, and so many, many, many others. And, uh, Elizabeth and, and others. So uh, thank you all for coming. It really means the world for us. And again, let's give a big applause of welcome to our playwrights who traveled from yesterday. They were. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Uh, I read because uh, I'm uh, so excited and emotional. <laughs> and uh, I, I don't want to make uh, a lot of, of mistakes. So. So when I met Frank for the first time, I was just arrived in New York and I was studying how to develop a humanism project. Humanism is our company with Tommaso Spinelli and uh, Marco Calvani. 
And uh, when I decided to leave uh, Italy to make a startup for contemporary Italian culture management, theater was not my first thought. Also, with my long uh, theatral background, teach me that performing arts management is not a, bus a business at all. Also, my experience in Italy was strictly connected with production of Italian contemporary dramaturgy, and I was, and I'm, I'm already, I am, convinced that a theater based on the use of Italian is not international at all. Our experience with France and other European countries comes after a long work to make this connection possible. So I saw that was a long, long story before to, uh, to build this from uh, America and Italy. Another problem to have Italian theater in our development uh, was and is uh, the terrible economic situation in which performing arts live in Italy. Professional companies have a lot of trouble to siliconize their work and many of us live in a paradox where to, uh, to, uh, you have to pay for to work. No income, just bills, make performing arts and theater in particular completely dependent to the government. This situation is, is not changed by the last uh, year till now, of course, but when Frank Hansker met me to propose a work on a project about dramaturgy, I saw this, this was an occasion for me too to study another kind of management and to experiment the American way uh, to open a new bridge, a network between Italy and USA, but also to bring with me more than uh, the hope that it was possible a new kind of management to start a positive changing in Italy. So I involved uh, uh, the best uh, uh, authors uh, and uh, the best uh, uh, um, hours of uh, uh, dramaturgy and uh, they suggest us uh, the last three year uh, prize uh, plays and playwrights and uh, we choose uh, the four uh, of, uh, of the plays that we see today. Uh, okay, that's all. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have uh, uh, more to say. Uh, uh, sorry? Ah, of course, uh, I have uh, two so thanks uh, a lot of uh, uh, help I had, uh, first of all, from uh, Italian uh, uh, Cultural Institute. There was a really a very uh, surprise for me to have uh, as a, uh, a, a support of our project. Of course, uh, Martin Silva Theatre Center, and uh, uh, last but not least, uh, the media partner, that is uh, Rai Radio 3, uh, that is we are represented by Graziano Graziani, that is a freelance journalist and also a journalist uh, that works with uh, the, the, the broadcast uh, right here. Uh, that's all. What I have to do now, Frank? <laughs> 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 Sorry, but I stay behind behind the chance normally, so I, I don't like to be on stage. And, uh, <laughs> and, and, but I think Frank now we. we I have to introduce the directors, please. I think we start with the first. Okay. Okay, I have the first one. Thank you very much. The first excerpt from the first play, uh, we start with that one, it's called, We'll be off to spare you further worry, by Daria Florian and Antonio Tagliarini. The play is an indictment of the austerity measures wreaking havoc in Italy and the state-owned tax collection agency Equitalia, whose policies have caused extreme suffering 
and even financial ruin, thus precipitating many suicides. Now, in the play, there are four actors. Tonight, we are going to see only two actors, because we do only ex except for the play. And the actors are Batia, er, Beate Heimbener and Jane House. Thank you. Thank you. Besides the uh, workings, deepest workings of the mind, and uh, we have not been able to find the core action. <laughs> and so, and, and if we've come to realize anything at all during this time, it's been the importance of saying no. You can just say no. There is power in refusal. In saying no. What's so great about making do? Fail, adapt, oh, come on, do it. Even if you're not ready, no one will ever notice. It won't matter. But no, no. We do not want to be accommodating. <laughs> because we are dealing with an incomprehensible deed. A powerful act, one that is freely taken. And moreover, a deed that's to be enacted here, a fabrication, which quite incredibly resembles reality. Like the act of four Greek pensioners who, because of the economic crisis, voluntarily take their own lives. When dealing with this incomprehensible deed, how should we act? Can we just make do with what we have? No. no. Because this representation, in all its complexity and simplicity, should manifest itself like a, a giant rock crashing through the ceiling of the theater and landing right here on the stage. I know, I, I know I'm contradicting myself. I know that I said we're not doing it, but the temptation to film something. Yes, it's true. Saying no, it's very difficult. Mm -hmm. There's something perverse about this, the inability to stick with no. Although their no is more about facing the world with extreme serenity and sensitivity they are facing a society on the brink of ruin. And they are saying, we'll be off to shame to spare you any further worry. This is not an accusation, not at all. We'll be off to spare you any further worry. We are four pensioners, alone, without children, Without a dog, first they cut our pensions, our only income. Then we needed a doctor to get prescriptions for our medications, but the doctors were on strike. When we were finally able to get our prescriptions, the pharmacy informed us that they would not give us the medications because our National Health Service is in debt. Therefore, we had to pay for our medicines out of our own reduced pensions. So we realized that we are a burden to the state, to the doctors, to the pharmacists, and, and to, to, the, and to the, the entire society. society. And so, <sighs> no, <laughs> no, it's the same difficulty. We're telling you what we had no intention of telling you. <laughs> The thing that gets me is that when I'm home, all these problems, they don't bother me. If I'm at home and someone asks me, how are you doing? It's not like I say, no, 
when I watched TV, I, I thought it didn't have to end in like that. And in fact, a TV is on with the volume low. One of those enormous TVs that look like an old computer. Then, if you go into the other room where there's a double bed with two more old women laid out, looking blear eyed, their eyes staring at the ceiling, their slippers neatly in place in the side of the bed, but they're wearing their stockings, their skirts are well starched, and everything in this house. You know, like when you put everything in order to make a good impression. And on the table, the one with the lace tablecloth, there's the note, the one explaining the reason why, which ends with, we'll be off to spare you any further worry. With us gone, you'll save money on our poor pension, and you'll be better. And the most disarming thing about these banners is these four identity cards neatly laid out on the table as if to say, we don't want to cause you any bother. The deed is done. We made the decision together. We all agreed. The only thing out of place is a half-empty bottle of vodka on the kitchen table in order to discourage any other speculation. They say that taking sleeping pills with vodka is the surest way to die peacefully in your sleep. The chaos is outside. Inside the house, everything is peaceful. Simple? Simple? No. Outside, the rain is pounding. Athens is in a shambles. As soon as you open the front door of this two-room apartment, right there on the stairs is the 40-something-year-old landlady. She is furious. Just look at that. Will you, will you look at that? So now what? Is it my turn? That woman hadn't paid me rent in for the last six months, and I live off that rent. Am I supposed to commit suicide as well as to get money? standing in the pouring rain, watch the bodies being carried out and see themselves in that scene. I don't talk this way at home. I'm not like this at home because something always happens at home. Someone always interrupts. Here, here, everything becomes immutable. The only thing I'd regret if we don't perform is that we've experienced beautiful moments in our work. There was a moment when Monica, she's upstairs, up, upstage there, almost in shadow, she was sitting down mm -hmm. wearing a dress with a pattern of faded flowers, her hands together, and she was biting her lip a little. She instantly became one of those four women. Oh, me too, me too. I found myself thinking about things that I'd never thought about. It was like discovering dust under the carpet. I discovered that even inside me, there's a point at which I too could put an end to things. I can't take it anymore. There's no point even in going.
who was so serene when he was dying in the hospital, I asked him, Marco, how do you do it? And he said, well, you know, when you feel that life is unendurable, when everything is beyond you, then there was that moment when Antonio was acting out one of the old ladies who had taken the sleeping pills and vodka and anxiously said, want to be the last one to die. I don't want to suddenly find myself. Because it's not like sleeping pills affect everyone at the same time, so that everyone dies just like that, tack, all gone. It depends on various factors. I don't want to be the last to die. Then she looks at the old woman seated opposite her, Valentino was acting out one of the other women, a Caterina, and said, do I have to spend the rest of my days curbing my love of life? He said it with such old world dignity. My economic problems are not my love. My economic problems don't prevent me from loving my life, from building a life. But how are you going to build a life for yourself at your age? Yes, I teach Greek every Wednesday evening to immigrants. Did you know that? Ah, if you didn't know it. <laughs> but what would be the point of acting it all out now in front of you? Do we have anything to offer you? No. I don't agree. Some things could be acted out. There were some things, maybe not everything, but some things could be shared. I am so angry, but with myself, with myself. I have never been so angry with myself before. During the day I'm in control, I always have been, I go to bed, I immediately fall asleep, exhausted, and then around 4, 4.15, just like that, I wake up all of a sudden with a start. How did I not think of it before? How did I not foresee all of this? How did I get to this point without a margin of safety? Nothing. And what will I do in 10 years? 60, at 70 years old, what will I do? It's already too late. Now I'm faced with a struggle every day. Every day I have to struggle. There's this girl who lives across the street. I always used to make fun of her. Oh, the poor thing. And how I envy her now. I am envious of her material security. She has built herself something indestructible. And I, who used to feel so, so courageous, so unordinary, where has all my courage gone now? What happened to it? And courage to do what? I'd like to be angry at something outside of myself. Because if I continue to be angry with myself, with my own choices, with the things I did not foresee, I'll end up getting sick. I know, I know, I'll be sick. And there's something else. We want them to abolish that state-owned tax collection agency from the north of Italy. <laughs> that Echo <laughs> Italia. No, not so Fine on my late payment of taxes. What will they do to me?
to me. When I was 30 years old, I used to tell myself, I'll do this for another three, four years. If all goes well, good. If not, I'll make a change. Seven years have passed, but it's not so clear if things are going well. It's not so clear. So you say, okay, fine, let's go on for another couple of years, let's wait until 40, but it's never clear. It's never clear. So you go on, and in the meantime, you downsize, you make cuts, but how much can you cut? What is the limit? At what point do you say, anything more than this is impossible? No, I've had it, that's it. Like the fear of not being able to go on, of not being able to stay in the world. I wake up at night with a jolt. I wake up and I'm afraid. I start thinking about all the things that can happen to me, the most awful things. What if I get sick? What will I do? It's not so much about when you're sick. You just lie there unaware of anything. But afterwards, when you're convalescing, still not well. <laughs> if life is going on outside and all around you, I have this friend <laughs> who says, oh, and she is very <coughs> sweet. She says, with that eternally optimistic voice of hers, cheer up when we're old ladies. All go and live together. We'll keep each other company. We'll help each other. <laughs> I'd rather shoot myself. <laughs> I prefer that. I have always thought that. I'd rather shoot myself. Santorano, uh, translated by Ana Carnero. Um, and I'm just going to read a bit that uh, Michelle wrote about this piece. Um, I would define myself as a living author rather than a contemporary one. My works often deal with people strongly connected to the land they live on. Another key element is the South, not conceived as a geographical place but as a social dimension everyone can belong to, a South inhabited by disadvantaged people who still claim their right to live. The healer is a man who connects stories to people to cure them. He is tired and old and drinks grappa. Healing is not an easy matter. It takes need, carelessness, liberation, and separation. He is not a magician nor a doctor, but merely an obscure compromise. In the background, a wall with three doors. On the left door is written double, on the right door single, and on the central door private. They are very dirty. The healer is wearing a shirt with no jacket. He is drinking a glass of liquor. The collar of his shirt is visibly dirty, and he is very unkempt. His brother comes in. Who is it? Who is it? Who do you think it is? Who should it be? You must say when you arrive. You must say aloud. You must raise your voice when you arrive and also when you leave and when you stay and all that. You must speak loud. The bottle again. Or I will have to chain the front door. How much have you drank? Is it of your business? Is it your business if I have drank? These are secrets, personal affairs. 
useful things to me. You must raise your voice. You must. All right. All right. I understand. I have to speak loud, but now it's enough. I understand, okay? What do you want? Me. For what? I understand I have to speak loud. When you understand you always want something from me, what do you want now? I don't want anything. Hmm. Nothing. Just leave that bottle. Keep cool once in a while. Why don't you leave yourself alone? Why don't you leave yourself alone? There comes the poet. The intellectual poet has arrived. It's my business. It's personal stuff. I don't want to tell people personal stuff. I must heal on my own because my intellectual brother doesn't want to put me in a nursing home. If you want to start healing, start with your eyes. When have I healed the human body? Huh? When? This is for doctors and criminals. I'm neither of them. You spread the damn word around. Have I ever put my hands on this one or that one? No. So what? What is wrong with my eyes? They don't see. <laughs> you can't see anything anymore. You need me to raise my voice when I come and go. And you're always breaking glasses and dishes and bumping into things. You spend too much money because you don't heal. The money is mine. The eyes are mine. It's all yours. All mine. All, also you. Also you, who I never really wanted. Also you're mine. You and all the shit around. It's all mine. Don't so you think you should begin to pass <coughs> something along? Here they are, the dirty words about inheritance. You know, you've taken all the inheritance yourself. We were born out of the same mother, weren't we? Don't you dare talk about that bitch. <laughs> <coughs> well, I've become a healer, like you. You don't know anything. Yeah, that's not true. If I was the healer, we would have power, money. Let me be that. If you want to be a healer for power, then you should go to a contest to be the emperor of the two Sicilies. Uh. If they do that. What, what time is that? I don't know. Well, do you have an appointment? Well, you don't know about it? Was it today? Look, see, move, look. I'll go get the calendar. I cannot see. I don't read the calendar. I can't see anything on the calendar. You must get it and read it to me. I want to know who's coming and I want to know from you. Make an effort. I'm not a clairvoyant. Uh, how can you seal and heal someone when you don't even know who it is? When it's necessary, I know it. It's, uh, it's a couple. No more information? <coughs> she called me. She says they have a problem. Who has a problem? She has a problem. Well, how do you know? Uh, I know. I just, well, how would you know? What are you, a clairvoyant? Mm, no. <laughs> you are a clairvoyant, a blind one, very original. I'm not a clairvoyant, and I'm not blind. I'm a healer, and I don't see much. Very original, anyway. <laughs> I don't care if it's original or not. There's too much originality around. If you're too original, nobody comes. <coughs> they have nothing to say, but they say it with a siren's voice. But sirens, since the world is what it is, live just from dawn to dusk. Those are butterflies. And the sirens. The butterflies and the sirens. Everything is simple, true. What is original dies. Simple, truth. Maybe you understand that it's important to be simple, to think simple. Not easy, simple. You know the difference? Between those two words? I have explained it to you. And I have understood it so well. I see that. You see. Who do we have? 
You have already told me. Well, what do they do? I don't know. Age? I don't know. You'll be surprised. A uh, plot twist? Announced, therefore useless. Painful, I would say. Why? Because now we expect big things from these people that are coming, and they come, and we get disappointed about who they are and actually are. Stay in the perfect illusion. Illusion of hope. It's a reasonable mechanism. If I was the healer, I would say that it would be good enough to wipe out hope. Delusion would be wiped out too. If you wipe out hope, everything falls down the deep well hole. But you just said I just that said that without hope, you're dead. Who are those two? Uh, a man and a woman. Or a woman and a woman. No. There's a man. There's a man. What does he do? I'm not a clairvoyant, and I'm not blind. Close your eyes. Works as a, a cannon man. That's not possible. Cannon man don't exist anymore. And what does she do? They don't exist anymore. The cannon man. All things end. Even the most beautiful the cannon man. They were not beautiful, but but they also ended. <laughs> Imagine. She is a secretary, and he is a. Member of the town council. He has an animal picture on his t-shirt. <laughs> See? You are a blind clairvoyant. <clears throat> Who is it? It's me. Another one that doesn't want to speak loud. What do you want? Uh, to heal. What else? She wants to heal. But if that thing doesn't come, if it doesn't, what can I do for you? here for a week. When does that thing come? My dear, how the hell do I know? <laughs> well, my blind clairvoyant knows everything. Uh, two more people are coming today. That means nothing. Two more people are coming. You deceive people. 500 people could arrive, but there's no guarantee that it's the right thing to heal that one. How can I explain that to you? You don't have to explain anything. I know how it works. You know how it works. And why don't you become a healer, then? Again? You must poison me if I don't wake up. You don't die. Will you die? Yeah, what happens to us if you die? Should I go back to the room? Mm -hmm. uh, why, are you still here? <laughs> <laughs> the shirt I'm wearing. What? How long have I been wearing? Why don't we put the clean one on the bed? Uh, this week I just what impression it. will I make with a dirty shirt? Go get me a clean one. The doorbell rings. Who is it? How can I know? I'm not a blind clairvoyant. Uh, well, what should I do? What should you do? What the hell should you do? Open! We're waiting for two people. And the clean shirt? Let's do that next week. Open. <laughs> a wife and husband enter accompanied by the brother. They are normal. Absolutely normal. She is not fat. They don't have oily hair. The husband is wearing a t-shirt that has a big crocodile picture on it. <laughs> uh, go ahead and make yourself comfortable. Beautiful. You are what? <laughs> What's beautiful? Uh, the healer doesn't see very well. Would you like to tell him what you have on your shirt? <laughs> Me? Crocodile. What are I telling you? He doesn't want to take it off. I tell him to take it off, but he doesn't want to take it off. The crocodile. He doesn't want to take it off. I tell him, but he doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> Is it my turn? I don't know. <laughs> Should I say something about the crocodile? As you wish. Ah. Then no. I have nothing to say about the crocodile. I like it. I tell him to take off the shirt, but he... Is it 
Is it always my turn? No, I understand it's not your turn anymore. Break. You tell. Break. I said, you. Lady, do you have more to say other than your husband must take off his shirt? <laughs> yes. I, I have. I have something to. Yes. Yes? Yes, exactly. Yes. Then say it. Instead of saying yes. We didn't understand. Nothing. I meant that everybody gets hurt, then needs help. We are finally speaking the same language. When people feel bad, they come to me, they dump on me their trash. <laughs> but do you think that's fair? You need to see someone to heal a hurt that, that's not a momentary.
Hello. Um, my name is Paul Takahach. I'm uh, the director of The Neighbors uh, by Fausto Pavidino. Um, and we have a, a short little um, writing about to give you a sense of the play. Um, he is alone in his apartment. He hears some footsteps coming from the landing. Trying not to make a sound, he looks through a spy hole. He tells Greta when she comes home that he saw the neighbors. How were they? He cannot tell. Seeing is not understanding, but he is scared. Why? Who knows? What about Greta? No, Greta is not afraid of the neighbors. She can't wait to meet them. But she's afraid of the old lady. Which old lady? The old lady she sees uh, at night, the one who used to live in the building. This play is about our fears, real and imagined, about ourselves and the other, about neighbors near and far, about war. from the hallway. He places a bottle of wine on the floor, trying not to make any noise. He looks into the hallway. He shuts the door very slowly without tearing his eyes away from the hallway. When the door is almost shut, he slams it and immediately looks through the peephole. Red enters behind him from the apartment. <laughs> Are you nuts? I spoke to them today. To the neighbors? Yes, to her. What's she like? Is she being normal to me? No one is normal. I only spoke to her. And what did you say to each other? Hello, hello. You're our new neighbors. We're the ones in front. You're the new neighbors. It's great here. Yes, it's great. Did you address her politely or casually? Politely. Politely, then what? Well, nothing. It's important to get along. So everyone's, you know, so closed off today, so frightened with everything. It's important to be able to see others simply as human beings and not as threatened. Go all the way. Indeed, take out all the stops. Yes, it's not personal. It's easier. I told her about the sugar. The sugar? About the old lady. The old lady's sugar? You're the one who told me. About the sugar and the coffee, which now you take about. I don't remember. About how all the shops were closed and you made yourself some coffee and then you realized there was no more sugar. So then, you didn't know what to do. You just stood around for a bit. I don't remember it at all. You plucked up your courage, went out into the hallway, and rang the old lady's bell, bell once, then again. And you heard her walking slowly, reaching the door and waiting. And, and she was watching you through the peephole. And you didn't see her, but she saw you, and you tried to look reassuring. You only wanted some sugar. And a bunch of time passed. and. You didn't hear any footsteps, which meant that she was behind the door watching you, and so then you came back home. I, I closed the door and just stood there, listening. You remember? No, I'm imagining. Mm -hmm. You stood there listening, and you heard the old lady turning with a key in many locks to close the door securely because she was afraid of you. Well, she was afraid of everything, of people. And you drank your coffee without sugar. And now you always drink it without sugar. And you're afraid of people. That is not true. I'm not afraid of people. Well, then I let you know, right? I went and got wine. Mm -hmm. Did you talk to the supermarket people? Well, I'm not a gossip, am I? And I am. But I love you anyway. <laughs> he moves to the door where he deposited the bottle. He picks it up, remains standing for a second in front of the door, staring at it. She watches him. He then moves and begins opening the bottle. He pours two glasses. The old lady was a real bitch. Chin chin. They clink glasses. Scene five. The doorbell rings. He enters from inside the apartment, moves to the door, looks through the peephole, and opens the door abruptly. Good morning. Good morning. Sorry to disturb you. I'm uh, you're not disturbing me. Uh, the, the new neighbors. I'm of course, Karen. Uh, she told me a great deal about you. Yes. Uh, we are not married. Is that right? Uh, yeah, it's 
not yet compulsory, thank God. <laughs> Do you believe in God? Let's say I don't possess sufficient facts either to believe or not believe, but there's one thing I cannot and don't wish to believe, that if there were, if there existed a, a perfect being, because they say that he is perfect, don't they? They say that. In spite of Auschwitz, in spite of Hiroshima, oh my God. <laughs> see, see, I'm taking his name in vain again. I am making a terrible first impression by bringing up Auschwitz and Hiroshima. Uh, <laughs> you, you might both be Jewish. Or Japanese. Or Japanese, of course. Although, just for looking at you now, one wouldn't say Japanese. Recognizing a Jew is more difficult, one would need to inspect the foreskin. <laughs> <laughs> but in, in your case, it's, uh, thank, thank you. It's sweet of you to laugh. Thank you. For what? <laughs> My husband also tells me all the time he thinks I'm sweet when I laugh. No. No, I, I didn't do that. I never presumed to do that. I wasn't saying you are sweet. I was using the word sweet meaning kind, being, being kind. Oh. Uh, so then, on the other hand, you are married. You and your husband, I mean, are married. My husband and I, yes, we are married. And you, thank God, are not. <laughs> Why, thank God? No, I, I'm very much in love. That's what you said. I did. Earlier. No, no, no. I, <laughs> See how easy it is to misunderstand. With all the best intentions, I was saying that it's not compulsory, thank God. That's what. And then you wanted to say something about God, but you didn't finish. Are, are you really interested? I don't know. Uh, forget it then. No, no, tell me. About God. That's what you were talking about, isn't it? Yes, of course. Uh, yeah, I, I'm saying that if, if he is perfect, despite everything, I cannot believe that he'd be so thin-skinned. I understand that as a defect, no? Are you thin-skinned? Yes, but I am not God. I am not perfect, and I am thin-skinned and depraved, and moreover, with all my vices and flaws, I don't demand that I be worshipped, that my name be not taken in vain. I, I wouldn't even strike anyone dead if they did. See? So you're depraved, then? Yes, I believe so. And what are your motives? Excuse me, I didn't wish to be so <coughs> intrusive. Oh, well, really, I'm the one who intruded into your home. That's right. Uh, did, did you want something? Salt? Sugar? Uh, Greta told you the whole story about the sugar, I know. What story? Concerning the former neighbor who didn't want to give me any sugar? Really? It's incredible how people can sometimes be so suspicious. Uh, yes, really incredible, but did, didn't she tell you about it? I don't think so. I may have also forgotten. Uh, may I offer you something? I wouldn't want to. Uh, uh, coffee? Uh, a glass of wine? No sugar, then? In the water? Uh, no, I mean, I, <laughs> I cut you off, but you, you needed something. No, Greta, Greta? Uh, yes, Greta. She asked me to stop and say hello, or else I think it's sweet or something. She's not here. Oh, I see. Is she coming back? Uh, it's strange that she told you to stop by. Uh, today, was it? I don't know. I don't remember. I say so, yes, to stop by, to stop by and maybe perhaps we have something. But if I can't swear that it was today, I suddenly understood that she meant today. No problem at all. You're very kind, but nevertheless, it's very embarrassing for me. If I hadn't been so sure she said today, if I hadn't been so sure that Greta would be here today and expecting me, I, I definitely would never have come into your home like this, putting myself in an embarrassing position, compelling you to make an effort to no, be kind. No effort at all, really. But I think I should. Uh, no, you shouldn't. Do you think it would be appropriate for me to wait, or...? Uh, that is up to you. No. Nothing important. If Greta told you that, but, but it's, it's I who wouldn't want to detain you. Well, then I'll go. As you wish. If, if you'd like to, to wait <coughs> ten minutes or so. When do you think she'll be back? Oh, I don't know. Normally she wouldn't be back. But if she told you. <laughs> it may be that she forgot or that she said it without thinking. That could very well be. But you know how Greta is. Yes. Yes? <laughs> <laughs> and, and your husband? Silent type. At this time. You make up for it. I talk too much. You're very outgoing. And that's a good thing. Very good. I'll go now. <laughs> <laughs> Some time passes. Scene six. He and Greg. You made it back very late today. Did you miss me? I always miss you when you're not here. And when I am? Sometimes. <laughs> Are you missing me now? She was here today. The neighbor lady. The old lady? The new neighbor. Yes, of course. Well, why did you say the old lady? By mistake. What? Yes, of course, by mistake, but why? I don't know. Does there always have to be a reason why someone makes a mistake? In a majority of cases, yes. You said the neighbor lady, and right away the old lady came to my mind because she's always been our neighbor. That's why. 
She hasn't been that for years. But the word neighbor still lives on, and it refers to her. So right away, that, that's all. Yes, but I said she was here today, the neighbor lady. That's right. She was here the other day, too. The new neighbor lady. Or the old lady. When I dreamed about her, I, I felt as if she were actually here. You told me in the hallway. I told you in the hallway? Yes, you were in your underwear. Well, are you sure I said in the hallway? But absolutely sure. Well, I remember her being here. Here, here. Yes, she's here. I see her. Right now. I feel her. <laughs> but she was here. And I wasn't in my underwear. Well, then she was here another time, because the other night. She was here. She was here. But I wasn't here. She was alone. You were here with her. And you and she were there. And you and the neighbor lady. She was drinking some, she was drinking a glass of water. The, the new neighbor lady. The old lady. You drive the car. Get ready to 
not into me. I have a partner who doesn't show up after inviting a sort of new girlfriend into our home. Then she says she'll be out for a second to make her excuses, and she comes back two hours later after spending time with a couple of half-naked relative strangers who are sociable, but who don't talk. <laughs> are you jealous of your neighbors? Are you, are you jealous of the fact that I'm trying to be sociable without any neighbors? Oh, <laughs> listen to that. She's sociable now, too. Uh, of what does this sociability consist of? Does it have anything to do with the fact that they were half naked? <laughs> In what way is the man sociable? <laughs> I don't know. Feeling. I, I, don't, I don't know how to explain it exactly. See that? You're reticent. You don't want to tell me, do you? In what way is his wife strange? You told me that she's strange. In what way? That's what I asked you. Okay. Okay. <laughs> how were they dressed? <laughs> you really want to know how they were dressed? Yes. Precisely. In detail. Yes. <laughs> Do you remember how she was dressed when you saw her? No. No? No. And you know why? Because you've never given a shit about how people are dressed. That's why you never noticed, and now you'd like to know how precisely how our neighbors are dressed this evening. Why do you come with me, with me if you're so suddenly interested in the condo dress code? Uh, you know very well why I asked that question. Because you honestly think that we indulged in a threesome when you weren't there? Is that what you think? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> so what is it that you don't trust? Because I don't understand you. What don't you understand? I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. I, I hate the neighbors. They're taking you away from me. <laughs> You've gone completely mad. But we've never quarreled like this before. Are we quarreling? It doesn't seem to me that we're quarreling. It seems to me that you're going crazy, and I'm observing you somewhat unnerved, to be honest. You think I'm going crazy? I think you're saying things that don't make sense. But, and I think the same of you. Don't you see that? Did you tell her about the sugar? About the old lady? Did you tell him a story about the old lady and, and, and sugar? Yes or no? Yes. It seems to me that I did. Is it yes or no? Please concentrate. Did I tell you yes? You told me yes. Well, then, yes. I have no reason to lie to you. You have no reason to lie to No. Well, then, yes. I told you yes. It's yes. But she told me no. <laughs> <laughs> she told you no. That's exactly right. Well? Is it so important? Yes, it's become very important. Really very important if you think I'm going crazy. Because in order to, to not become unhinged, I need to know what's true and what's false. But if you're not careful about what you say or don't say, how am I going to do that? I don't think you're going crazy. I think that for a little while, you've been very nervous. And you've been putting too much emphasis on things that aren't important. Like the story about the sugar. Like the fact you say they're coming over and then they never come. Or vice versa. Sh shouldn't they be here by now? How long do they need to make themselves gorgeous enough to cross the hall? <laughs> Maybe they heard you yelling and thought that perhaps it wasn't the right time. <laughs> Maybe it isn't the right time. But on the contrary, it is the right time. I think it's really the right time for us to sit down and have a drink together and try to understand all together what is true and what is false. And if they told you that they're coming over, I think it's good that they come over. And if they don't come over, I think it would be good to urge them to come over in order to avoid misunderstandings or, or incivilities or things like that. <laughs> you want me to urge them on. me to nurture you more than what's normal for one person to nurture another. My happiness depends on your being happy, but you can't blackmail me for that. Your happiness has to depend on mine, too. I cannot be a slave to your mood. A slave? You have to make an effort. An effort for what? An effort to be normal. An effort to allow your brain to nurture, nurture me. And not only not only, Not only what? Your fear. I don't know. I, I don't know what you're afraid of. I want to help you, but, but not as one helps a handicapped person, as, as one helps one who loves. I want to help you overcome your fear, but I can't do it, and I... And I... 
normal than it is too normal. But it is not normal. It is not normal as I as I claim it is. And so, and so, I don't do justice to my own fear, to my own anxiety, and I risk going crazy myself so that you don't go crazy. And then I don't succeed in saving you from going crazy, and so then you can't help me. <laughs> and, and it doesn't even cross your mind that maybe I need help too. Interior Conversation Piece, a play in three acts by Lucia Calamaro, translated by Jane House. <coughs> Sorry, Jane House. Um, so this is a story of family dynamics, uh, some straightforward, some strange and perverse. Uh, it's an all-female black comedy in three acts. The mother, Daria, lives with her daughter, Federica, among bulky modern appliances uh, and godlike monumental fi figures. Over the course of the play, they confront reality as they eat, chat, and get dressed. Sometimes other characters in the family constellation, such as the analyst, join them. This womb of domestic life is staged in chapters that lead not towards an ending, but towards an origin. Uh, the play portrays the indifference, rage, and helplessness of those living with depression. Um, and it is in three acts. The first part is the melancholy lady at the refrigerator, the second is Certain Sundays in Pajamas, and the third is The Analyst Silence. I wanted to tell you those names because I think they're all amazing act names. Um, so we are, <laughs> what you're gonna see tonight is uh, the prologue and the first part of the first act, Melancholy Lady of the Refrigerator. Thank you. mine, I mean. A breed of lucky people, I guess. People who are together. Who can take the bull by the horns. Who are farsighted. Who can... world. 
reality to their own needs. One must admit to their credit that they usually more always though, almost always have been aware of what their needs are. A special breed that knows, one that perhaps is not really learned, but at least know in or know it all. Then there's us, the, the others, almost everyone. Those who are confused, indecisive, melancholy, apathetic, lazy, those who are alone, the strange ones, the timid ones, and the just okay ones, those who are deluded, disillusional, the cynics, the ideologically and metabolically drugged, and then in addition, those who always feel exhausted, exhausted from the thought. In Latin, the word is sepis. <laughs> so then we, so then, we, we what? We nothing, that's precisely it. <laughs> So then, I'll have a little snack. <laughs> <laughs> what should I eat? <laughs> what appeals to me? <clears throat> I'd like something good. Maybe something a bit sweet. Salty, I don't know. <laughs> Some sort of mash. From the Jana. <laughs> Good. A little dry with ketchup, maybe. <laughs> Not properly closed. This is moldy, too. Pointless for them to say, keep refrigerated after opening. Usually it gets moldy anyway. What's this? <laughs> A couple of knots of mozzarella. Still good, the mozzarella is fresh. It's filling. Uh, uh, kind of all a sweet taste, that clean taste. It, the northern part is more consistency. You have to chew it more. Mm. It needs some bitter orange marmalade. No. <laughs> Compote of eggplant and truffle Yeah. 
core of it is. What are you doing here? Oh, you thought I was acting weird. Of course, you're not invisible, you know. And wearing that coat? <laughs> I was cold. It's late. Do you know the time? Off to bed. Now? Right now. Stand up straight. <laughs> Normal straight. What's wrong? No, nothing. It's just that I was over there and I thought, I'm coming over here more so that would be a bit more, I feel a bit less. What's mama doing this time of night, I thought. <laughs> Come on, don't make a face. I'll keep you company. Look, I didn't want to be alone. Well, I'm all on edge. It's not, just because you're here now, I can't just stop doing what I was doing to dedicate myself to you. <laughs> no, but I didn't even ask you for anything. Oh, yes, yes, you all say that. You all say that. And, but then the guest and the person who enters the room after you is by convention your guest. <laughs> so especially if it's your daughter. You know what Sorishian means? Oh, yes. It's a sacred duty. She needs care, warmth, attention. And I'm feeling really humiliated. So look, it's the dead of night. It's past my mother and hours. I guess I'm on strike. So you're really not on my mind right now. Adios. <laughs> look, a light, Mama. Look, it's the fridge. <laughs> <laughs> now it's night. It's dark. <laughs> Go over there to bed. Eyes wide open. Sheep. Ah, you got all dressed up. You look like that lady from that film the other night, Marnie. <laughs> <laughs> I never know what to wear. <laughs> Why do you say that? Am I usually badly dressed? No, not badly. But you're all uncoordinated. Hey, they're my clothes for the house. Comfy ones. Exactly, but this is beautiful. It's just the shoes. <laughs> <laughs> they're a bit, well. They're house shoes, but they're ugly. Well, they're like yours. That's right. <laughs> but sorry, who bought them? Who do you think buys things? I do. On sale. <laughs> but they're comfortable though? Exactly. Practical. It's a home. But then you're all blocked with a mushroom thingy. You look good. The chignon? <laughs> <laughs> it picks me up. It's that if I don't do my hair, I feel dowdy. Do you know what guano means? <laughs> Mama, so what are we going to do? Oh, you see that? You want me to pay attention to you. I'm hungry, are you hungry? No. So then do your own thing on your own business. Because if I tell you to do something, you won't do it, and, or you'll do something else. A person should know how to keep busy in their own home. It's not a dorm. Place to live. There's some strawberries in there somewhere. <laughs> For weeks I wander about the house with some difficulty, slowly, as if questioning its authenticity, as if I were somewhere else anyway, and not there, as if the territory were unknown, inhospitable anyway. It's being closed in that gives me that feeling. Hospitable, anyway. Being closed in that gives me that feeling. There's hostility in the air. I move from my bed to the computer, to the fridge, to the computer. I open it, close it, open it, reopen it, 
There's not much to eat. I'm basically not, not hungry. It's not knowing, it's not knowing what to do. I moved do. from one place to another, I think, but not, but not, not really. Much no definite really. thought when no I'm wandering about the house without tidying house. up. I never try to tidy, try to tidy up. up. I should do it more, I should do course, it more and dust, of course, and but I don't consider them my job. I don't consider them my job, ones that I've that I've never done them. Modality is unknown. I go back to the fridge. Nothing good. Nothing but all the same, I gnaw on a piece of cheese. It's something. What's needed is something quick. Something filling. Which gives the sensation of filling up the thing that's in my thorax, I think. But I'm not sure. Although, thinking it over distractively, because everything has this modality of absence when I'm inside the house, I realize that the food isn't getting to my breast. I realize that the food isn't getting to my breast. So then, what can fill one up? In the meantime, I chew. In the meantime, I chew. I don't know. I go back to the computer. If only there was some wonderful letter to answer, but that's rare. It takes a lot of effort for someone to write and tell you things. All, All I receive, receive is invitation, invitation after invitation after invitation after invitation, after invitation, after invitation to go somewhere and see someone, someone doing something, something which basically, which basically doesn't, doesn't interest, interest me at all. Me at all. <laughs> I go back to the fridge. I open it. I look in. I leave it open. I look more carefully. I think maybe I'll make myself another coffee. Maybe I'll make myself another coffee. It doesn't matter what coffee. It doesn't matter. I put on the coffee machine. I go back to the fridge. I never know whether I miss something. I never something. know whether I something miss something. Important. Something, something, important. something that would give me some something pleasure. That would give me some I pleasure. stare at the food that's in there. The eggs, yogurts, candy bars, the butter I adore. I stay like that, mesmerized, spaced out. Jam and jelly. There are so many, all half empty. Plum, black cherry, most of them moldy. I open the jars and sniff them in the hope that there'll be something or someone or some while I'm standing there. Well, I'm something standing tells me that my problem is hiding in there, right inside there. But I've never discovered what it is. In all these years of my obsession with the fridge, I've never come face to face with the problem. I feel cold. Well, maybe close it. The coffee is ready. I reopen it. I take out the milk because I never drink it black at home. It's almost all gone. It black I home. must remember to buy some more. I must more. remember to buy some more and toilet paper. I arrange things. Big cup and a little plate. Hallway. I go to bed. I try to read Savini or Folk for Valeri Arendt, but almost right away I feel it was sleepy. I doze off. It's sunny outside. It's two or three in the afternoon. <laughs> I've nothing to do. It's happened again. I've gone back to square one. I no longer exist. I'll have to start all over again from the beginning. Are you asleep? She's asleep. We never talk. What are you doing? Uh -huh. <laughs> I'm closing the fridge. Oh no, no, it will be in the total darkness. <laughs> <laughs> there, poor bucks if you don't get an electric shock. Give me a cigarette. The cigarettes. I can't find any. Here they are. Sorry, but why are you lying on the floor next to the fridge? It's the coolest spot in the house. <laughs> yesterday already. Their reproduction, migration, plumage. But do you know how they make their nests? Mm -hmm. It blew me away. Sort of sad though. They push with their body, their breasts. They crush the material to make it soft, squash it from inside, push with their breasts, and circle around. It's the breast that really gives the nest its circular shape. How come you know all these things? I know them. I've read about them. Anyway, it's by constantly circling and pushing the sides all around that it manages to make a nice circular rim. It's the female, you know, Mama. It's the female that circles around. She's really strong. 
So that's what you thought. And what does the male do? The male looks for things, pieces of straw, grass, twig. He goes away and comes back and she circles around. Well, poor little thing, and it doesn't do her any harm? No, maybe a little. Maybe she gets a little tired, but it's because it's difficult. In nature, there's not a single piece of straw that exists in the rounded shape that's needed for the nest. So the book says, it's the female who pushes. It says thousands upon thousands of times, once, twice, and again, then again, and she circles around and pushes and circles. And then, okay. it's, then it says, get it. then it says constant repeated thrusting of the breast. What does that mean? Like this. <laughs> <laughs> to hyperventilation. She ends up totally rattled. Mother of God, what an effort the poor winged creatures make for such a wretched hideout. Well, I sure didn't know all that. Do you know how peacocks make love? No, and please don't tell me. It's a terrible thing. First of all, the male puts his foot on the neck of the female. No, enough! Enough, I said. What's the matter now? Nothing. Now you're smoking. Yes. So, you feel satisfied? Mm, yes. <laughs> so why are you making that face? It's my thoughts. So don't think them then and it'll go away. <laughs> what? Your sad face. Why should I? Now tell me why, look at me. Yes, I have a sad face. I'm in my own home, it's night time, and I can have whatever look I want on my face. <laughs> what about you? You have to understand that. People don't always face satisfied, especially if they're alone with themselves. I don't know, if I'm outside, of course, it's best to be happy, you see, for a quiet life. I agree with that. Take care not to spill over into the personal, but here inside, have patience. I don't like it. I don't like it. And sadness is okay. You try to push it back, but then you, you surrender to it. Sorrow can be triumphant for a while, but it passes eventually. So. <coughs> and then remember, ta tasamata mathamata. That's Herodotus. <laughs> From suffering comes knowledge. Mama, how long does a cigarette last? Yes, and that's what my aunt Blue Hilda used to say in her own way. The more you suffer, the more you know. Who can say that, poor thing? <laughs> Sorry, what were you saying? How long does a cigarette last? I don't know. How should I know? I've never... Well, let's test it out. So you count out loud, and I'll put it here, and we'll wait. And meanwhile, I'll put my head in the freezer <laughs> so we can see if the cold will do any good at least. I want to feel 
So, um, uh, first of all, thank you um, for taking um, the time and, and, and your talent. And um, maybe just uh, start uh, with you, and then we go over like, tell us a bit, uh, uh, it was an excerpt of the play. We only have the excerpts translated at the moment, even so we know a little bit the layout of the land of the play. It will be translated, hopefully, this is part of this truly unique project, next year with perhaps one or two translation workshops in Italy. And the big uh, vision, the idea is to have in two years or three years, maybe a festival where this place you know, will be really shown in a repertoire and, uh, and uh, so people will have a chance to see uh, what is coming, coming um, out, of, uh, out of Italy, out of Europe. I thought they were truly uh, uh, a highly uh, interesting place, well done, each unique, and even from those short excerpts you could feel this, the sensitivity, the subjectivity behind, but also asking the global big questions that uh, there's some kind of connection. But Moshe, how was it for you? How did you connect to this? I hope you didn't uh, feel as any typecast that you directed the uh, excerpt with the um, older generation. Yes, yes, I understand. Uh, suicide is a very serious problem, um, especially among young people, not only young people. But here's a problem. Uh, survive in certain comfort, they will do away with themselves as not to be a burden on society. Well, uh, this is uh, <laughs> very, everybody uh, reaches a certain age, of course, uh, thinks about this, not in this way, uh, everybody wants to live a little longer, of course, um, but uh, in myself, I am uh, especially um, touched by this problem because uh, three weeks ago, um, a neighbor of mine committed suicide. So uh, I was quite close about uh, with this problem. She was not an old lady. She was a lady in, uh, in her um, 60s, and she had everything. And that's not the, the um, material needs that always lead to suicide. In this case, and in most cases, is there is something lacking inside. I don't want to claim psychologist, I'm not a psychologist, or, uh, but, but uh, um, from what I see around me, and what I see in society, and what I see in the American society, is that people who are not in need and material dire need. Something is wrong with, with, with people in general. <laughs> and uh, um, they express the way they, 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 their suicide is, is, in my view, is violence um, directed on oneself. You cannot do violence outside yourself, the other, you do violence to yourself is the most, most the, the, the easiest way to, to I, I, this is a, this is a question that is always asked, and I'm not the one to, to, to find the answer, of course, not tonight. Thank you so much. It
just show that something seems to be broken, some uh, some change, some uh, uh, agreement within society. Italy post uh, pre World War II was really was a much poorer society even as it is now, and I don't think uh, anybody in a Sicilian village perhaps was worried whether they um, we are too much of a burden. Something was uh, essential. Uh, was, yeah. <laughs> Poverty is not the reason. Uh, I come from a very poor little village in Romania. More poor than that village cannot, cannot be, really. But we never had a suicide in that village. And we never thought about suicide. Because we, are, we were always busy where our next piece of bread would come from. So there was no question of suicide. In the big cities, in Bucharest, there were suicides. In our little village, nobody thought about suicide. Yeah, that, that it, I think it, it really uh, is a play that, that makes us think and question things. Let's talk about food and about uh, um, um, having food and not knowing really what to do or what was it. Um, how was it for you to connect to this play? And uh, Musara, tell us a bit about your experience of that directing the actual. Um, I mean, not to keep it on a depressing note, but uh, that play, um, it was very, you know, I, I read the excerpt, of course, and I didn't have the whole synopsis when we first started working on it, but reading that was very interesting because I had gotten that sense of her, of the of the mother character's isolation, and, and so reading that in the synopsis, you know, one of the themes of that play is depression um, and sort of this lack of ability to, to connect and to sort of have a purpose, which is I think sort of what you're talking about, um, uh, a feeling, a sense of a purpose in a, in a society or in a relationship. Um, um, but I mean, I, I find that with uh, material even that has some darkness in it, as that does, um, I am always sort of looking for humor, and it was definitely there because the, that whole um, that whole bit about and is Lucia here? Oh hi, <laughs> nice to meet you. Um, just that bit about the, you know, where she's in the fridge just going through all the little things, like we've all been there and just sort of feeling, why can't I be satisfied, you know, this, this thing isn't right and where did they even come from and who bought this stuff, like I don't even remember buying it, you know, I just, I, I love that and I connected, I connected so much with, with the humor of that and how, how human that was, um, even though she's this, this woman that, you know, you don't totally understand what's going on, um, and, and why is she like her? You don't you, you can't possibly understand her isolation, but you there are these moments you can kind of connect in, um, and just that relationship with the daughter and the daughter trying to connect, and it's eh, not quite happening. And I, I just wish I could read the rest of it. But. Well, hopefully we we, we um, will be able to, to do the review so and uh, direct it. And Paul, tell us a bit about uh, your experience. Uh, how, that, does it sound like a play from another point in another world? Is it it's, it's, it's funny, I mean, did the, neighbor, the neighbors, the the neighbors right? uh, the, yes, um, it, 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 I found it, I was quite taken with the piece because as I read it, it, I mean, we're, this country is wrestling with its own fear of the other in a very real way right now, and every other week we're being told by somebody that there's another that we have to fear, so there's something really prescient and, and of the now, and that is, that, that, that is broader than just really an idea, I think, of the global idea of the now. That really resonated with me, and the thing I really liked about it was that it had it, it had its own sort of singular light touch. It, it didn't take itself too too seriously, but it dealt, but it told it dealt with serious issues in a very very light way, um, almost a subversive way in that regard, which I really appreciated about it. Um, and I really enjoyed the musicality of it. There was a really great, wonderful sort of um, drive to it, a pace, a tempo to it. Um, that really that really appealed to me. So on, on many fronts, it was a piece that really um, sat with me in a great way. Um, yeah, I, I think all three plays uh, were very playful. I think this language very masterful, the dialogue and the heaviness of one sense, and also um, um, the, uh, 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 the the seriousness of the questions about families. I think it was about the woman and the question was about uh, relationships, about teenagers. Uh, um, but um, now let's come uh, to um, um, uh, the, the, the theater. And um, um, uh, Jordan, I don't know if I understand why it's also the story from a healer who in small villages do the business of healing. That's what they do. And um, 
there is a generational conflict, of course, can you do it, does it fit in our times or not? How did that feel to you? Um, I was initially struck by that we meet this man that is the healer and is so, so clearly and seemingly something's broken on the inside of him. And his relationship with his brother is, has such turmoil to it and the way he feels about his mother, which is so explicitly um, not good. Um, and then, uh, and how inarticulate he is about all of that. Um, and how he has to spend his life healing other people and not dealing with his own feelings. And then we meet this husband and wife who are so inarticulate about what they need healed. And that he was a boxer, um, which is such an incredibly violent profession. Um, and that he's hurt and he has that line, um, the hurt that doesn't go away and that's what he needs healed. Um, and how neither of them can express what that thing is and it becomes about a shirt. Uh, and her, her anger that he won't take his shirt off, this, this shirt with a crocodile on it, um, which is seemingly such a, a microcosm of this larger idea that there's something broken in their relationship. And how just, I guess I responded too to just, we all have this like need to be healed um, and that we go to these outside forces to, to do that for us instead of you know, dealing with what's right there. Um, we will have to go on to the next one with our playwrights who flew all the way, so I will apologize to throw you off. <laughs> but still, no, no, I, one more, one last thing. Do you feel that connects, uh, like everybody, is there something you think for the American audience, will people, what is your feeling about this? Maybe you will, yeah, sorry. Right. So, uh, um, life is always connected to city, <laughs> universal. So uh, it's, uh, it's very interesting to, to see how other people see life and how other people see death. Uh, it was very interesting in this play that really found the ultimate, ultimate gift to society and the society they live in, not to bother them and to, to give the gift of life to the to the society as not to be bothered by them. So uh, in, the, in this sense, it's a very interesting uh, point of view. And uh, I was very interested in, in meeting this in, the, in this play. Um, it was very interesting for me to, to see that, 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 that a European point of view about, uh, about death. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that the, the um, issues in, in origin of the world are absolutely universal. Um, I think, as I said, we've all been in that moment with the refrigerator, um, and uh, and just that just that seeking, that um, searching for purpose, and that trying to fill some interior void and not being sure how to do that. I think that's um, that's so. So universal, um, and and I mean I think that she had, uh, yeah I mean it was for me it was so amazing to just sort of see that come through um, through translation and through the through this other culture um, that just feels so so connected to it. The food in the refrigerator was like maybe a little fancier than food mm -hmm. I would have, but um, <laughs> but that goes with our assumptions about Italy, I guess. Um, but just just yeah, absolutely a, a totally universal story and. And one that, that I, I think it, it's it's very important to share that and, and recognize that have compassion for other humans, recognizing that everyone is, is looking for looking for that, looking for some purpose. Yeah. Well, do you think audience would come and in like America? This would be a festival. Of Undoubtedly, I think it's I think it's a play of the now. I think it speaks to what's going on in, in this country. I mean, in Europe, in this country, in, in, in the world at the moment. There's there's this fear of the other of what lies beyond us, and um, yeah. And, and, and it, it, it lets us laugh at the, the absurdity of all in so many ways. So, you know, I, I absolutely think it would address it. Yeah, love it. And, and Jordan, what's... Uh, yeah, yeah, someone asked you to say you could choose four or five plays to direct and then do you think would you choose that play? Would you say I'll do that? Or? Sure, yeah. I mean, I think that there's... Uh, I mean, what I, what I said before, there's not a person in the world that doesn't, you know, need to be healed or want that in some way, whether they can admit it or not, and that we're all searching for, for something, something to help us. Do you need to be healed to touch?
like someone else, or can you be broken and also right, right, yeah. Yeah. In, in all of these? So, um, and I think perhaps, you know, the communities in a, in, in a New Orleans or an Asian community, would, this would also, I think, uh, have uh, a, another resonance. Or in, in California, the idea of healing and the spiritual healing um, and blood social healing is, is, is a different one that perhaps can, can relate to that. And also the idea that these people that have money, that are, that are rich, come to these poor people to be healed and to find, to find wisdom, which I think these class issues in our country right now are so, so present. Well, thank you so much, and truly, <laughs> it's very of those writers in Italy, and many uh, uh, introductions to these plays. How does it feel to um, hear those plays in, the, in the English? Are they the same? Are they different? Um, what was your impression? Uh, it, it was a powerful <laughs> impression. I mean, um, I know all the pieces we saw in Italy. I mean, uh, I saw the, um, you know, the show they, they direct, because uh, all, the, all the artists that are here uh, also director, not just writer. And uh, I think that, um, in a way, they are different, of course. Uh, the atmosphere sometimes is different uh, because uh, you can stand that, uh, the, 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 the level down of acting, for example, it's, uh, it's another temper temperature, you can say that. <laughs> and, but at the same time, the relationship between uh, the characters are, are totally the same. And uh, this is a discord to me because I really, and I accept uh, Fausto Paradino that I think that uh, write a very universal piece. I mean, like uh, I, as I say this morning, it's like a machine, like a, you know, a mechanism. And the other, the other authors, I feel that writing really you know, to me it's universal, but I, I can read how they are connected with the, with the place they, they grow as an artist. For example, Miguel Santelamo, that is not with us, uh, is really connected with, uh, with the atmosphere of the south of Italy. And we used to say that, uh, we, you know, me and some other critics, we used to say that Miguel Santelamo is like a link between uh, the south of Italy and uh, the, the Beckett place, because uh, there's this feeling of waiting, but uh, it's not like, uh, you know, uh, it's like a feeling you have re uh, seen at back at place. It's something totally natural, because you are uh, in a land that is a little bit stuck in poverty. Uh, there's no possibility to go uh, somewhere else or to change your situation. So it's something deep involved in the, the way of uh, Santana right? And uh, it seems to me like something really deeply connected with the, with the land he comes from. But uh, when, I, when I look at the situation in here, it seems that that can be universal in a way. So uh, it was a little discord to me uh, to, to understand how, because we can, we, we can imagine 
that the relationship can work even abroad. But um, sometimes we are too involved in, a, in, a, you know, in reading the background. Here there's no background, but the relationship is the same, I think. And uh, in Lucia Gramado, for example, uh, that is okay, quite, quite an um, uh, archetypic relationship between mother and, 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 and daughter. Um, anyway, she, if, you, if you know the way she writes, you, you can understand how uh, it's inside some neurosis of our, of our time in Italy. Uh, that I think is not totally comprehensible overall, but uh, what I see here, it was almost the same situation, I mean, except it was, uh, uh, okay, uh, besides past, of course, another, another show. Um, so I think that uh, there's something totally different, but the, 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 the scheme, the, 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 how do you say, the schema, the schema, the scheme, yeah, the scheme of the relationship uh, is really, uh, you know, understandable without without uh, knowing the context. Thank you, Sabrina. Without um, the, the footnotes, and I think you made a good point. I also want you to know that the writers really are also auteurs in theatre. They write, but they also direct it. They have companies. So something happened. It's not just playwriting, playwriting. It is really. Um, they are uh, that kind of new, new, new generation of um, creators um, 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 for for the um, theater. Uh, maybe uh, we'll ask uh, Tasso how uh, how was that seeing your play? I know you work a lot also in London. You've been at the Royal Court also in France, but you know, we have seen your plays in English language on stage. But uh, how was it to, um, to 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 hear about tonight and take the mic as it should be on? Um, so tell us a bit about your, your impression. But tonight, <laughs> well, it was great. It was great. I'm really grateful to the translator, the director, the actors that tried to, to do such work. Uh, it, uh, <laughs> it was a, a funny, I had a funny impression and uh, I watched him in uh, in English because uh, in, uh, um, in the very beginning uh, of the play and, and this was uh, the very beginning uh, I was uh, a little bit uh, inspired uh, in, in a very funny way uh, by some aspect uh, of uh, her painter's uh, plays uh, where characters don't uh, recognize uh, what is uh, evident uh, where tried uh, to do with the present uh, the same thing that the uh, hard painter uh, does uh, does to the past no? in painter there is uh, something that uh, comes uh, from a choice where uh, characters uh, remember and uh, by remembering their past they rewrite uh, their past no? so they are the products uh, of uh, imaginary biographies that created uh, in their mind. And uh, um, when I started uh, um, uh, writing the plays, uh, but that's uh, something I, I realize now, uh, that was uh, a conscious decision. Uh, but uh, when I started to write the play, I, I, I tried to, to do to the present, the same thing that the painter did to the past, in a, in a, in a funny way, of course, because uh, uh, it's obvious uh, to forget uh, the past, it's a little bit less uh, obvious to forget uh, the present. But, uh, but I was, uh, in a way, uh, very much influenced, uh, as usual, but uh, in, a, in a conscious way, but, uh, by the rhythm and, uh, and by the, the paper stress of the uh, printers. So in, uh, to, to write and uh, listening to, in English, uh, I had the impression that uh, it uh, that the play got back uh, to its uh, original language. <laughs> Thank you, thank you so much. I saw that it was a wonderful translation by Jane House. He was yeah. also acting in the program. Maybe you give a little. Uh, yeah.
Um, talking about uh, uh, excerpts of play, um, Lucia, I, um, I think the entire play, is it three hours long yeah. um, in your play? So how does it feel to hear an excerpt of 15 minutes in another country with jet lag of a play that's only three hours long? And, <laughs> and you're the most literate, the most, you have the most words on stage. So how, how, how what can be your mind? Beh, era bello, era bello. Uh, it was very beautiful. Uh, Grazie. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sara, and thank you, the beautiful cast. You and the other one, mm -hmm. Sara, thank you for the action. Uh, ma uh, era, mh, io ho avuto una sensazione liberatoria. I had the sensation of uh, liberation. Perché, eh, a differenza di quello che dice Graziano, eh, what Graziano has said, in Italia questo spettacolo eh, uh, <laughs> in Italy the show passa come uno spettacolo eh, con una problematica <coughs> generazionale. Uh, comes out as a, a show about generational problems, issues. Uh, mentre fuori dall'Italia, forse, forse, finalmente. Well, I, outside Italy, maybe, and uh, finally, I hope. Uh, torna a essere lo spettacolo che io volevo scrivere. It, uh, it becomes really uh, the show, the play that I really wanted to write. Uno spettacolo su una crisi esistenziale. Uh, a play about an existential crisis. E no problematiche madre figlia. And, and not about <laughs> mother daughter uh, issues. Questo per me è importantissimo. In Italia non hanno capito. Uh, this for me is very important because in Italy nobody has understood. Quindi, grazie, grazie, America. <laughs> Thank you. Um, uh, maybe, Eliza, I, I, ne next to being an actor and a playwright, you also are a theater critic. You write a lot for theater and about theater. Uh, seeing this variety of uh, plays, um, um, I know you also have a little Italian background, but um, <laughs> what, what, uh, what uh, 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 do you see signals that, that are of significance also? What? <laughs> <laughs> okay, I thought that I was only going to help translate. I didn't know. <laughs> sure, like, what did I think of the, did I see Italian signals in the play? <laughs> Is it, uh, 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 what do you think of what you, what you saw and heard? I thought it was terrific. Um, well, I mean, I can't speak objectively because I was in one of the pieces, which was such a delight to be in. Um, but no, I mean, I feel like the directors covered this story, Terry, very well, and as, as have the playwrights, that, uh, that while there are an abundance of uh, particularities to the Italian culture, nation, Europe, etc. There's also a tremendous amount of universality in each of the plays that we've seen tonight. Um, and I think that that's uh, a testament to having curated such excellent artists tonight. Yeah, and I also the, the, the craft and the level of playwriting itself, uh, independently from what you're asking, is truly a, a very, very strong, um, um, I think, presentation of Italian uh, contemporary theater, which we have not at least we might have missed it this little bit, but we have not uh, heard or seen that. So it is quite, uh, uh, quite, quite, uh, very, very strong, um, I think, um, 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 manifestation of contemporary Italian theater. As a final word, uh, maybe Valeria, you are the producer in a way of the event. You also want to create the festival. Um, so is this evening in, in the spirit what you think, what you thought? Is something missing? Or um, now, after working on it over a year, and this was now the first time, what? What it, was for your <laughs> it is uh, our start, so uh, I, uh, I am very happy that after uh, a whole year of uh, hard work, we are at this point, uh, respecting the deadline that we <laughs> met, <laughs> because it's not this simple. And uh, I feel uh, this project uh, is uh, very important because uh, is uh, uh, bringing something uh, not 
uh, not only to the eventually American audience, but uh, to Italian theater. So <laughs> it's uh, very important for me that that uh, point. But is uh, the starting. We have uh, to work a lot to grow up, and uh, now I hope uh, we can uh, translate uh, the whole place. And I hope uh, that uh, for the translation will be respected uh, that my and your hope uh, to have a residency with between authors and translators in Italy maybe. And, uh, and then uh, this is uh, our second step and now I look forward for the second step. Uh, you know, I walk step by step. I, I don't uh, look uh, a lot in advance, no? Uh, but I am very, very happy and uh, I can't believe it. <laughs> that's all. That's all. Also, I can believe that we had a lot of uh, um, uh, of uh, support in Italy because uh, this is very important. We have uh, Teatro della Tosse, we have uh, uh, UTIS, that is uh, the center of dramaturgy in Italy, and uh, we have uh, Cantieri Florida, that is another theater, and we have also a, a private. Uh, private people that put uh, some money to make it possible because uh, uh, Antonio, Lucia, Graziano uh, and uh, Fausto are, are here because uh, we strongly desire to have uh, them a guest. So it, it was not simple, it's uh, like a little revolution, mm -hmm. but uh, maybe I can't explain it now because uh, we know in Italy, there is a little revolution, but uh, okay, this is just a start. Well, thank you so much. Thank you, you should, so much. You should be so thank proud. You. Thank you for coming. Uh, uh, we do have a QA and a question and answer, but we are only an hour over time. Uh, so, but let's go if you want to come to the archive by again. It's on 36 between 5th and Madison, in the middle of the street on the uh, 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 south side. Thank you.